Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when I was a teenage student at Washington University in St. Louis, my only previous experience having my mind blown involved mind-altering drugs and rock music. But then I heard about a professor who taught aesthetics in the philosophy department. He was the ultimate out-of-the-box thinker. And for those of you here tonight who may have also had him as your professor, perhaps you can relate to this. Professor William Gass caused my head to feel like it was exploding in profound ways, with electric shock waves firing and new synapses forming inside my brain as he lectured, and I felt so lucky. He turned on my mind in ways I had never previously experienced, teaching me Rilke, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Colette, and Gertrude Stein, and introduced me to wild schools of thought like Dadaism. I hung on every word and even brought my father to a class when he came to visit. And to this day, at age 84, my dad still talks about the class. And my former classmates and I still talk about that hair. <laughs> William H. Gass, the very reason we are all here tonight. When I was in college, there were celebrities on campus. They were professor celebrities known by their last names. Nemirov, Elkin, Finkel, and of course, Gass. What I didn't know at the time was that my entire career, much of it in media from television news and now uh, journalism and book publishing has been about out of the box thinking, unusual perspectives, and having the confidence to think differently and to approach ideas differently. In looking backwards at my life, I can now see how my roots of creativity sprouted in that William Gass classroom, soaking up the aura and guzzling the alternative reality of the humanities that was magic to me and the other students. We were in awe, listening to this man performing word gymnastics in front of eager, impressionable, and mesmerized students was worth the price of admission, which was high even then. Tonight, we will celebrate the legacy of that great mind. He was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, a philosopher, a poet, a translator, an originator, a deeply relevant and ridiculously brilliant genius whose prose has captured the imagination of the world with his works translated into so many languages. The accolades are vast, from winning the National Book Critics Circle Award an unprecedented three times, to his inclusion in Best American Short Stories five times, Best American Essays five times, and coining the phrase metafiction. The New York Review of Books in 2005 called him, quote, our greatest living champion of the sentence. The list goes on and on, and suffice it to say, he was one of the greats. And to those of us who know and love Washington University in St. Louis, he was one of ours, spending decades teaching at WashU and then dedicating his papers to the library, and he will, we will hear from Joel, his curator, tonight. This event is specifically timed to celebrate the publication of a monumental achievement, which you are looking at right here, the publication of the William H. Gass Reader just yesterday, and it comes out less than one year after the author's passing. And we are blessed to have with us here tonight the woman to whom this book is dedicated. The dedication page reads, To Mary Henderson Gass, Savior. And I want to acknowledge that Mary is here with us tonight. Thank you so much. It means so much to us that you are here. Also here tonight is Joy Williams, back there, a prominent novelist and short story writer. She has been a frequent visiting Hearst professor at WashU and is a member of the Academy of Arts and Letters and recently reviewed, received the Haddada Award from the Paris Review. Now to our esteemed panelists. Joining the panel is Jan Castro, a woman who was a neighbor and a friend of William Gass and co-founder of the highly acclaimed and world-renowned River Styx the oldest literary magazine in St. Louis, which began in the 1970s and used to pay writers like Will Gass $5 a poem. <laughs> we will hear more about that in a moment. Jan, we are thrilled to have you with, with us tonight. Jan is also the author in her own right, having written the best-selling The Art and Life of Georgia O'Keeffe, among other books. And Jan has a Master of Arts from Washington University. Also joining the panel is internationally acclaimed best-selling author of City on Fire, there he is, Garth Riss Kahlberg, who, like me, was a student of William Gass. Garth was a member of Gass's final philosophy of literature class and graduated from WashU in 2001. So thank you for being here tonight. 
We are also honored to have with us tonight the man whose Wall Street Journal review of the William H. Gass Reader described it as a, quote, dazzling compendium of fiction and literary essays selected by the author himself at the end of his life and writes that the collection conveys all the pleasures and accompanying frustrations of the Gass experience, a fitting memorial for a writer and theorist truly in the American grain. I was so impressed by the review that Sam Sachs wrote just last week, uh, and Sam writes the weekly fiction chronicle for the Wall Street Journal, and was a founding editor of the online arts and literature journal Open Letters Monthly. His criticism has appeared in magazines from Harper's to the London Review of Books, and I, I was really blown away by the review, and I reached out to Sam on Twitter last night and asked him to please join us, and so he graciously agreed, and we are so excited to have you here, Sam. Um, along with Steve Rosenblum and Suzanne Wagstaff and Nick Diefenbach, who make up just part of the incredible team of the Washi family members, as I call them, in the development office, and they help create incredible events like this one tonight. We have a very special guest who curates the modern literature and special collections at the university libraries. And our panelist, Joel, is not only here in person, but he's also brought from St. Louis some of the priceless archival material. And you can hold some of it up. Joel has been with WashU since 2012 and administers and promotes the collection of more than 175 prominent American authors, including, of course, William Gass. So let's just begin by going around the table with each of you talking about your relationship with Gass um, personally, professionally, and your thoughts on his legacy. And we might as well um, start with you. Um, so I think this is a very hot mic, so I think if I just Talk. Can everyone hear in the back? Okay. Um, so when I came to St. Louis uh, as a scholarship kid in 1997, um, I was largely in pursuit of endowment money. I think that's what took me there. I had no particular sense of where I was going. I just knew, okay, that, you know, they've given me a scholarship to go here. Um, and I did it. But I kind of quickly became aware that, particularly the English department, um, but the humanities departments more broadly, uh, were like lingering in the afterglow of some kind of extraordinary moment that had lasted from, I don't know, maybe 1968 to like, uh, probably the death of Howard Nemiroff, maybe. Um, and I always wanted to write an essay about it, like St. Louis, the Paris of the Midwest. Um, you had these, um, you know, this constellation of writers uh, who were based there. You also had writers like Joy and many, many others who were passing through um, via the Hearst professorships, which I think Bill was very involved in making happen. Um, and you had like anecdotes being passed around campus, like. Um, Bill and John Gardner getting into a, I mean, the anecdote makes it like a really violent argument, you know, about um, fiction in the kitchen of, you know, uh, Stanley Elkin's house or something, <laughs> nearly coming to blows. And when you're 18 and you hear that kind of stuff, you go, you feel very validated in your, in your calling to be a writer. So um, I quickly kind of deciphered that that Bill was at the center of this. And my dad had really, Omen Sutter's Luck and In the Heart of the Heart of the Country were two books that my dad really revered. And I remember freshman year going home at winter break and like, I think I drew like a hot bath and like read the entirety of Omen Sutter's Luck, like drinking beer and taking a hot bath. And it was just, you know, it really awakened me to the possibilities of language and, and I was lucky enough to be there at a time when I could actually take his class and then subsequently ended up uh, his intern at the International Writers' Center. So um, it, it just made literature as a way of living seem like an actual possibility rather than a pipe dream. Um, so uh, Sam, I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to spend any time with William Gass, but you certainly spent a lot of time with his words, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right. I, I think I'm the, the odd person out here in that I, I didn't, uh, didn't know uh, William Gass personally, but I 
knew him as a reader, and, and the things that you described coming across in his class, the verbal gymnastics, the erudition, the excitement, the exuberance about books, are all the things that really impressed me as a reader. So he's someone I've read in parts throughout my life, and he always had, he always had a very individual characteristic in my mind. Um, and I think reading this, uh, reading this, and reading this collection, really drove home the reason um, that is that he sort of stands alone. He doesn't really, he roughly does, but he doesn't exactly belong to a group or or to any or to any movement exactly. And the the thing that stood out to me is that. Throughout his career, he seemed to do things exactly the reverse of what you're supposed to do if you want to be successful as a, as a fiction writer and as a critic. By which I mean, if you want to be um, popular or well-regarded as a critic, you generally need to be fairly skeptical, um, fairly distanced from the things that you're writing about, not emotionally involved with them, you need to be a little bit, um, a, perhaps more negative than positive. Um, you need to be doing the work of sort of taking the not quite successful text and trying to drag it up to some higher plane where you think it belongs. Um, you're sort of, you're supposed to be sort of on uh, an Olympian who's sort of uh, distantly judging the works of people who are not quite up to snuff. Whereas if you're writing fiction, you should be, if you want to be successful, you need to be life affirming. You need to be humanist. You need to have an essentially positive message. These are the two sort of the yin and yang that you want to hold if you want to be commercially validated, commercially popular, uh, popularly validated. But with gas, it was the complete opposite. Fiction is fantastically uh, uh, pessimistic, unsparing undiluted, uh, undiluted, um, extremely unsympathetic in lots of ways. It doesn't gives no quarter whatsoever. Whereas the nonfiction is essentially a party. It's a celebration. It is. He has a line in one of the essays which he says, one should read uh, as a paragon of appreciation, which he's describing the way that you the way that you read by just involving all of your senses and all of your reactions to the text. He was essentially an appreciative reader, and his criticisms are these beautiful works of appreciation. But uh, so, so those two things set him outside the mainstream, basically made him fundamentally antagonistic to whatever the establishment was going to be. And the fact that he could do that and did it faithfully and devoutly throughout his entire life for an entire individual career based on that is, is an extraordinary feat and did it unflaggingly. Um, it means that his work and his name have their own, they, they create their own category. They sort of stand apart. Um, and that was something that really, that was driven home to me as I read this book. It's extremely impressive. Um, it's beautifully done and beautifully curated and hats off um, to um, the editor at Knopf who worked um, so hard on this book um, with the professor and the writer. So take us back to River Styx. Was take us back to the 1970s in St. Louis and to the formation of something that has gone on and to this day to be a very important literary resource for the world. My association with, with Bill Gass um, actually shaped my career as an essayist and poet. I, in 1981, I audited his intro to philosophy class, and I began to read The World Within the Word, uh, his many other books, um, and also all of Plato's Republic, uh, Montaigne, and Augustine, and um, so I, I kind of had a different learning experience auditing his class than, than uh, Lisa and Garth, just because I think I was taking a different class. So I was kind of steeped in philosophy and, and what Sam has kind of described as his appreci deep appreciations of other, of literatures. 
Uh, so in 19, winter of 1981, I interviewed Bill for the Associated Departments of English Bulletin for the Modern Language Association. And 14 years later, I interviewed Bill for Bomb Magazine in 1995. Bomb published Bill's self-portrait, which was shot looking into a glass window that reflected Bill, the camera squared in his face, and a giant warehouse behind him with storage spelled backwards in capital letters in the glass. Storage somehow hints at the deep readings for which Bill was known, from Plato and the pre-Socratics to Wittgenstein, from Stern to Grass to Paul Auster and J.M. Coetzee. Between those years, Bill became president of the board of River Styx for about five years during which I was executive director and River Styx magazine editor. Uh, in 1986, uh, we published what Joel is holding up called Family Album, which was uh, Bill's prose and Bill's photographs. So it's now a special collector's item in the Washington University collection. Yeah, we're going to pass this around, and um, I think it'll be interesting for people to look at it. And also during this period, the magazine and I uh, won the CCLM award, and we um, brought Margaret Atwood, Grace Paley, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Jan Rothschild is here. She was a program director for River 6 PM and a WashU alum. And we, so I think uh, Derek Walcott was one of um, Bill's favorite guests. And, and so the program, Mary and Bill generously hosted a few receptions for the River Sticks. And they were uh, close to novelist Stanley Elkin, his artist wife Joan Elkin, and to fiction writer Jarvis Thurston and his wife, poet Mona Van Dyne. So I feel like we, we, had, we were all neighbors and that um, the Thurstons and the Elkins were in some ways um, contributed to bringing Bill to St. Louis and the Elkin, the Thurston, uh, Jarvis and Mona published a Perspective magazine. Howard Nemirov and Carter Rivard were poets in the community uh, who were also close friends of mine. And we, we had some really wonderful parties together. At, at some point, I was aware that Bill was getting good offers at other institutions. And I sprang into action. I wasn't sure, I'm sure I wasn't the only one who told Chancellor Danforth about this. In 1990, the International Writers' Center was born and Bill had a budget to create his own programs on the newly established West Campus. I interviewed many writers he invited to St. Louis, including uh, Paul Auster and South African Nobel laureate J.M. Coetzee. Bill seldom talked about his Purdue years, uh, 10 years of not getting published, and he also seldom talked about the awards he received and the award committees he served on to honor other writers. He, he was an engaging teacher who could hold the attention of undergraduates and also he was my thesis advisor for my masters uh, as a graduate student. He became a street photographer capturing haunted and deserted buildings and objects. Bill talked about the tunnel written over three decades as a triple metaphor telling me, quote, there are all kinds of tunnels. There are tunnels that allow you to get from A to B successfully by circumventing an obstacle like a hill. There are tunnels in which you discover ore and precious things, and there are escape tunnels. The book is ambiguously structured. Maybe it's all three tunnels and more. It's chilling that the tunnel's dark narrator who suffers from fascism of the heart, has become too familiar a character in today's real life dramas. The sweep of the new William Gass Reader is a perfect framework for remembering the scope and depth to which William Gass has excavated the literary landscape, from his remembrances of great books 
to his philosophical investigations of the sentence, to his conceptual fiction characters like the Peterson kid who's a frozen object who has to be dethawed. Uh, this perhaps uh, led to his essay in Harper's Musing Over the Baby or the Botticelli, which does one save? The essay assures us that even if we hypothetically can't have both, value systems are important metaphors for empowering ourselves to think through how art enriches our lives. Um, I'll end with one anecdote. I have another, if time permits. Um, this one is about the 94-year-old Lebanese-American writer, Atel Adnan, has created a film and a City Lights 2005 book that transports Bill Gass's book uh, structure into another demographic. It's titled, In the Heart of the Heart of Another Country, and is a patchwork evoking the civil war in Beirut, Lebanon, between 1975 and 1990. What counts are not the moments when people are killing each other, but those we can create out of what's left. Part of Bill's message to all of us is to conjure soundscapes that unveil new epiphanies. Thank you so much. Um, let's talk to Joel for a moment about um, putting together the papers, putting together the, the archive. Um, you were never a student of Bill's, although you were able to work with him to put together the collection. What do you have in the collection? Tell us about the enormity of it and the, the, the most precious items there. Sure. Sure. So, um, I came to watch you in the uh, beginning of 2012 and uh, as a curator of the Modern Literature Collection and all of the, thanks, all the writers that have been mentioned tonight who were so central to St. Louis and Wash U were all gone except for Bill and um, it really was one of my great pleasures to get to know Bill and Mary in the occasion of uh, Middle Sea being published in 2013 and a uh, retrospective uh, exhibit we did at the library um, not only covering his writing but his photography, his, his time in the Navy uh, during World War II, um, his work with River Styx with International Writers Center um, and all of his colleagues that he worked with and in that time I got to know Bill and Mary very well um, they were very generous in lending us things for the exhibit and we have a, uh, a digital uh, version of this which uh, I encourage you to look at through our website. Um, and what is the URL for the website? Uh, it's, it's called, uh, well, it's library.wusel.edu. If you go to Special Collections, you'll see it there under Digital Exhibitions. Uh, it's called The Soul Inside the Sentence, which uh, I worked with Bill a little bit on deciding on a, um, a title for it, which was, uh, uh, I was really happy because he chose the one that I I wanted, I gave him some options and um, he liked that one best. Uh, but anyway, the, the collection really started in, in the mid-late 60s when the Modern Literature Collection was being started by Van Dyne, Finkel, Elkin, and uh, others. Um, and uh, they, they asked Bill for his papers before he was even published, before Omen Setter's Luck was, well he was published in, in, in periodicals, but before Omen Setter's Luck was published. And so he was very uh, self-effacing about it, but um, Eventually, he started sending manuscripts, and this was before he was even a professor at WashU. So, um, it was a, a an example, uh, as, as was mentioned, of uh, the writers and the collection bringing um, Bill to campus um, as as a professor. The collection itself um, does run from his uh, earliest drafts of Omen Center's Luck to uh, Middle C, basically, and um, it has. I'll hold this up for you. Thank you. I brought some examples. So those of you who haven't been to the corner table over there, I invite you to stop back there before you leave. Um, so these are drawings from the tunnel, um, which he uh, did himself. Of course, this is the flag of the party of the disappointed people, uh, who the narrator um, conjures up uh, as, um, as a 
kind of a Nazi-esque party. Um, and um, the, 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 the pennant of passive uh, emotions. And so these are visual um, structures of, of Gass's thinking of the narrator. And you see this a lot in a lot of his drafts um, of essays and fiction. And the archive is really rich in these um, inner workings of his mind, you know, the evidence of how he was coming up with not only his great sentences, but all of the concepts behind them, right? Because he was a philosophy professor and he was very much interested in the philosophy of writing and of reading and of words. And so all of that is in the collection. And what I brought today uh, is kind of representative of what's in um, the William Gass Reader. I use that as kind of a guide for um, some samples. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's really a great, a great collection that, that brings in students every, every semester to look at his writing. Uh, they read In the Heart of the Heart of the Country very often, uh, so they look at drafts of that, and um, more and more scholars are coming in uh, to use it as well. Um, so I'd love to hear from everyone how you believe um, Bill's body of work will be treated by history. Um, well, one thing I just wanted to add, are we on the, we're on the same mic. This is the nice hot one, right? Can people hear in the back? Um, so w one thing I wanted to add to what you were saying, Sam, um, is that as the, as, and this is sort of somehow getting close to what's essential to what Bill was doing philosophically, as the essay, as the critical essays are celebrating these other writers, he's very, very conscious of, in a way that, like, I, I feel like I almost have to reach for, like, Montaigne or, or Emerson or someone, of the essays themselves being works of art. You know, they're, they're shaped. So I was just paging through the galley on the train, and I started reading the essay, uh, Carrots, Noses, Snow, Rose, Roses. That's the title. And the first sentence, and I think, Sam, you can feel, as somebody who writes critical essays, you can, you can feel this. The first sentence is, Marcel Proust has once again taken his vacation at Trouville. The present tense, the narrative setting, you're in a story. Nobody who writes critical essays thinks to do that, you know? And, and you read the thing, and it, it almost out-Proust Proust. Like, it's, it's almost... Um, it's a thing of beauty in itself. And so before this collection had appeared, I had conceptualized that there should really be a Library of America edition of the collected essays of Bill Gass, including On Being Blue, which is not in here. And as a body of work, that alone, just the essays, would be, you know, I think something that would stand the test of time to borrow one of Bill's titles. But for me as a fiction writer, I'm, I'm personally even more excited by the fiction, which many people, um, you know, have one or two books that are their favorites, but, the, you know, kind of are, can't find purchase with the whole. So I think the, the essays are like the most accessible version. And if you just cleave those off, you know, you'd have an enduring body of work. But then there's this whole other, uh, country that I think is going to be discovered um, more and more, which is fiction. Yeah, he, he, he talked the talk in the essays and then he walked the walk in the fiction. I mean, he, he, he wrote... He walked the walk in the essays. In the essays, that's right. The essays also sort of embody the ideas that he's talking about in the essays themselves. But what I said before that he, he stands apart, he does, but he also forms a continuity. The novel is always going to be principally a narrative form. People, it's all, the majority of people who write fiction are always going to be mainly storytellers, interested in advancing a story, getting from a beginning to a middle to an end, and that's always going to be the case. But there's also always, hopefully, going to be a few people who are more interested in things like structure or form or sound or the shape of sentences, or how all of those things that I've described 
uh, coalesce to create an object, which guests often talked about what a book was or what a work of fiction was. It was an object, a thing crafted of many, of many parts. Um, so in that sense, he was that person. There always needs to be one person who's sort of holding the torch for those aspects of fiction and calling our attention to it, reminding us how centrally important they are. Um, so we have in the past Gertrude Stein, James Joyce, and then we had William Gass. Um, this is a, I'm leaving out people, but in a very... In a He's the last modern. Well, in a, exactly, in a very reductive way, he is the person who was carrying on those ideas from modernism. He was kind of alone doing that, even though we sort of, in our mind, we think of him in a class of other people, but he was sort of alone doing that. Hopefully there will be other people, there will always be someone who is standing up for those things, but if there is, that person is going to be drawing from the example of William Gass, who drew from the example of the modernists before him. So he's going to be remembered as a person who took a stand for these aspects of the literary form that are not, that are the forgettable ones, that are the ones that you can overlook if, and still write books. Like the limerick. Yes, <laughs> that's right, the patron saint of, uh, of the uh, of the limerick. Um, so we are one day past the midterm elections and we have a president who doesn't read. Um, so what, what does that say about our society and does this make writers like Gass that much more instrumental to the fabric of our country? Well, it's, it's like cautionary tales because, because again, certainly the tunnel is, is a very dark narrative and, and Bill was, um, you know, his goal was to take a, a despicable fascist character and make him a central uh, narrator. And so um, the reader obviously is repulsed and objects to some of the horrific things that happen in the tunnel. And, and I feel as though that was Bill's intention that that he wanted to, um, Arthur, Arthur Danto has a comment about, in his um, essay collection called The Abuse of Beauty, um, about being able to address dark topics in a way that also enlightens the reader and, and allows them to see the other side. So I think that's part of what he was trying to do. And, and he, he discussed that with me um, pretty intensively in um, uh, the bomb interview in 95. And he also talked about how he really wasn't a postmodernist, even though his friend Heidi Ziegler had um, called him that, and even though it was the postmodern era. And, and so he, he attempt, he didn't want to be classified, and, and I agree with, with Sam that he's, he was a, a, a bit against the going um, trajectories. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you have any papers that um, talk about the relationship between Rilke and Gass. Um, I recall it in my classes that this was, he had an obsession with teaching Rilke and translating Rilke, and I read somewhere that he said that he almost felt that he, he was because they were his words in English. Um, do you have any stories about that? Not really any stories, but I will say that we have uh, perhaps his complete translation worksheets uh, of Rilke. Um, as a lot of you probably know, he uh, worked you know, much of his life on translating Rilke and uh, wrote a lot about Rilke, and you'll see him um, in the manuscripts, in you know, just about everywhere, um, and you know, including in in the tunnel itself. I think um, you know, there's kind of the the um, salvation of poetry through you know through someone like Rilke to defeat that fascism of the heart that really he was getting at in in the book. Which I really think about him a lot these days. When what he would be saying nowadays, um, it would probably be pretty caustic and 
there's a true line in the tunnel, and I I've, I've gone digging for it, and I can't find it because the book is so freaking long. Yeah. But it's it's somewhere around two thirds of the way through, and it's like when the when the Führer of America, the Führer of America comes, he will be called Coach. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, just like a, it's just a great line, but it's also it's so it's so accurate and it's so telling. Um, but the relationship between beauty and horror is much more complicated for him because I think he was very, you know, there's there's an idea that's sort of central to modernism in its philosophical form, which is like sort of structuralism of the arbitrariness of the sign, meaning the sound of the word mama has nothing to do with your mother, even though in your mind, you know, they're, they're very, very fused. It, could, it could as well be Baba or you know whatever it is in some other language, and so he's fascinated by like the relationships that arise from pure sound, and how can something sound really beautiful or really compelling or really as a really hot tweet, <laughs> you know, and and its moral content be execrable, and so you, that's really part of the game in the tunnel is like. You know, you get to the end and it's, it, it opens up into such sonic beauty at the end, but it's like also so dark. Um, and I, like, I really think he was pushing that philosophical project pretty hard, and I think that will be something that, you know, I, over the you know, 20 years or 30 years, people will be writing dissertations on. Um, so he wrote about the difficulties and uh, the uncomfortableness he experienced as a writer, that it was painful, um, yet his words are startlingly brilliant. So um, can anyone talk about his process? Did it ever get easier for him? Um, was it always difficult? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always difficult. All right, so the joy of translating Rilke, but the difficulty of creating his own sentences. I, I really wanted to talk... Doing it well is always difficult. It's just it's torture. And I'll just, on that topic, one thing that's great about his older manuscripts where he's working on the typewriter, and there are examples of this back there, um, you'll see him writing a sentence or a paragraph over and over, trying to get it just right, and it just goes to show how much work went into those masterful sentences. It wasn't just something that you know came down and inspired him uh, from the sky. And in, in fact, something that occurs to me as you say that, like what, from what I understand of the tunnel, he had a bunch of these paragraphs, chapters, things he'd been, you know, um, the family album was actually a piece of the tunnel. Right. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of it. And it was only, it was like the word processor had, he started writing it in the late 60s. The word processor had to be invented so that he could, you know, figure out how to stitch these things together into a novel. Is that, have I got that right, Mary? Like it was the Getty Center and the, and the computer and the digitizing of it that allowed him to. Yeah, but they were all vision things. They all came from But the word processor did. That was. Like he had, he had a sense of it as a box of loose pages and it was only the word processes that sort of allowed you to move them around easily and see, you know, how do these things fit together. One of his visions for it was for Knopf to sell the book as as a man in manuscript form in a in a paper bag. Uh, so you're actually reading the manuscript of, of William Kohler, which they couldn't do. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I serve on some committees at Washington University, and one of them is the National PR Council, and we have focused on the difficulties that the professors of the humanities have today competing with science. And uh, medicine gets all the attention, the humanities gets, uh, they're the stepchild, and I'm wondering, that does not seem as though, at least I don't recall that being the case in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, it was... Yes, yes. The, the English department is not getting a new building, but 
um, in, in today's world with the humanities um, seeming to be less and less of a priority even than it was many years ago, what do you guys see as the future of writing and of the humanities for people uh, like yourself, a, a novelist? Do you find that things have changed in the 15, 18 years since you've come out of college? I'm just gonna, I have no idea. I'm just going to take this in a different direction. Okay. The reason the humanities of the ugly stepchild is because it's where the hippies all went. And one side that I think shows up in, in that slideshow and listening to Joel talk and listening to Mary talk and coming out of the work better is that like I encountered Bill as a a champion of Henry James, you know, um, and and a, someone who is really trying to preserve a tradition. But there was a side of him that was. I, there's photographs I remember from the St. Louis thing where he's like, I want to say he's covered in paint. He's like Ken Kesey. He's like a, yeah. You know, there's a real free spirit in there, a transgressive, you know, figure, and I love. That he was so industrious at, there was a puckish kind of troublemaking, art making impulse, and through industry and some sort of relationship with the chancellor, he was able to create all these institutions on campus or fortify them. So special collections, the Hearst Professorship, uh, the International Writers' Center, and for, partly for that reason, you know, that that campus has an unusually large, or had at least when I was there, an unusually large sort of cultural role being played by the community. Yeah, come, come up here because uh, I know you're... She is our Dave for now, was so William Danforth, the Chancellor. The other so girl. integral yeah. to forming the community. He was a scientist and a doctor, but he loved that whole writers, and he's been generous to a father. He was a wonderful teacher. Yeah. Um, so in 2005, Chancellor Mark Wrighton awarded Gas with his honorary degree, which was an honorary doctorate of the humanities, and he remarked that Bill had, quote, stimulated and enriched Washington University, and that reading his work or listening to him speak was a remarkable experience. So how do we, in addition to what you're doing at the libraries, how do we preserve the legacy, and how do we use his legacy to pave the way for a greater appreciation of literature? Uh -oh. Well, I, I think you create a chair, a William Gass chair, in the Department of Philosophy or Humanities. And can I just, to, I, to turn that question to Sam, like, is, so you, have you, you've been reading the critical essays on and off for years. So what do you, as a working critic, like, I'm a kind of like moonlighting critic, and you're like a real working critic. And there aren't that many. You know, there's Edmund Wilson. There's uh, who else is there? Who are the canonical? The people who are yeah. defined, you know, like Lionel Trilling or more recently someone James who's, Wood. Someone whose book review lasts longer than right. tomorrow's newspaper. Right. Is there anything that you, as a, a working critic, have drawn from, like reading these essays? The, the thing, the the thing that. Um, that that it remind that his that these essays reminded me of very often were were Virginia Woolf's essays of the common reader and, and one reason that they I think that they um, sorry are, that was the one example like, yeah. forget I that was the yeah. one Virginia Virginia Woolf Virginia Woolf and the reason Virginia Woolf's literary essays are the greatest that have ever been written by anybody is well one of the besides her being a genius and a brilliant writer is they don't um, they are not analytical in a way that is very hard to defend and justify. They are, they come, they are born of a kind of an intuition and a kind of an emotional response to what she's reading. So she's not going in and saying, well, here are the themes in this text and so this 
this book is about this. Not that there's anything wrong with that, it's essentially what I do. So. But, uh, but her responses come from a completely different, entirely individual place that you can't even say, Virginia, show your work. What, how are you defending, you know, how did you get to this reaction? How, how can you come to this conclusion of, about so-and-so? It's a very similar thing with Cass. He's, his essays are born from a completely personal and uh, iconoclastic response to what he's reading. And he makes no apologies for that at all. He doesn't feel that he should be embarrassed by that or that he needs to defend it to the academy. He just goes with it at length, you know, sometimes at incredible length, with incredible um, diagrams. With diagrams and with charts. And you just go, where are you going with this? Where did this come from? It's, uh, so, so if there's, so the thing that, the, re the way that that can be an example, I think, is, and the way that he perhaps is an example to how the humanities should think about themselves in the future is, don't try to be useful. Literature is not there to, it's not like, like, like law school or like medical school where you learn a thing and then you are suddenly good at a useful craft in the world and then you are a useful member of society. Literature is doing something completely different and to the extent that it tries to compete with the economics departments and make itself a thing that people should do in order to become, in order to get jobs and become sort of valued citizens, it's not going to work that way. You have, to, you have to trust in your own strangeness, in your own eccentricities in your own responses and in your own beliefs. And, that's, and then you get something original and completely, um, and that is worth preserving and that people sort of recognize, well, this is something outside the box of what we know what to do with and therefore it clearly has its own kind of cultural value. Um, that's the thing that he exemplifies in the criticism and also in, in the fiction. He's sort of a phenomenologist uh, in the way that Virginia Woolf is. He's proceeding from you know, what he, fe you know, he's, you picture this guy on a Navy ship somewhere, like, con you know, conceiving this deep relationship with Gertrude Stein or Colette to, to where he's going to write about her once a decade, you know, for, for the rest of his life, deepening every time. And the, so much of the critical essay that Sam practices and I kind of like dabble on the side with is built on this like analytical model, like almost like you're in a, in, a, in court, like presenting your brief. And the thing is, you can be really, really smart that way, but you don't get to wisdom or insight or or like truth that way. And and so it's almost like it, it's a learn. It can be taught to be a critic or an essayist who figures who proceeds from your feelings, you have to trust that your feelings about things are really true and are really interesting. And then you have to be able to access them. And then you have to read everything in the library to be able to defend the points that you're making. You can't just say, I mean, then you have to know all of literature. And so I find him very, you know, every time I, I find him dangerous to read when I'm writing a review because I'm like, yeah, it just makes me want to give up. It's like I'm, I'm not even, it's like I'm, I'm playing checkers and he's playing chess. Right, and there's a balance between uh, being so well read and, and having this breadth of knowledge and then being able to really zero in on your target and say exactly what, what you feel. And he's having so much fun. Um, so I know, that, do we have other questions from the audience? Does anyone have a question that they'd like to come up and ask? I'm, I'd like you to ask your own question because I'm not quite sure how to ask it. Uh, so, um, I'm a physician and I'm a, I was a philosophy major and I uh, took, I don't know, somewhere between four and six of his courses that I, I loved. And I actually some of the words that you use, puckish, um, I would almost add, add the word banality or dichotomous to his, his approach. So here would be somebody who would not be considered avant-garde, 
uh, although I was a philosophy major. Um, and he was embracing and encompassing and supportive in, in everything um, he did. And so it would be easy to, one of the questions, the, the comments that I made, to uh, quickly decide that he would insult Trump. But he would take, um, uh, he, he, would in, in, he would enlighten his approach to like discussing banality of Trump, uh, et cetera. The, the, the actual question that I asked was, there was like, I thought in terms of hearing him speak over and over and over um, about Joyce, I wondered what you thought about his approach to time. Uh, you talked about his words and his love of, of the sounds of words, but he also loved time in the novel. And he talked a lot about that with Ulysses. I wonder if anyone had any comments. I focused a lot in, in the review on the, the musical structures that he, that he adapted um, for his novels. And those are not, those are not linear things. Those are things that find a motif and then, and then, and then um, spin out variations on the motif. So, it, so, it be, so the narrative is not a thing that progresses through time, but a thing that continually repeats itself. Um, so in that sense, it, 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 does, it is playing with time, and it's sort of outside of time, or using it for its own devices in a certain way. I, and I, I mean, I see him as someone who admires, who, who it's, on some level, you know, part of what he digs about Henry James uh, and a number of other writers is that he himself, you know, among his his panoply of gifts, he can do narrative. Like the Peterson kid is a great taught narrative. Um, and I actually think Middle C has some, you know, great narrative sections, but it's not really where his interest is as a fiction writer, and it's not something that comes easy to him, which may speak to why the writing is, you know, is always torturous. So, you know, the fact that the tunnel could be a book of a box of or a bag. Sorry, I I love. There's someone, Josh here who's in publishing. I went to be like, we want to do a bag of pages. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, I'm a book publisher, and uh, I would cons. Yeah, I, I think there would be an eruption somewhere uh, but, but the fact in that the, the room. Could be a bag of pages. Makes it. To, this is a word Billy used about the tunnel. Anti-narrative. But he's anti-narrative philosophically. He's interested in like what's left if you don't have narrative. But I think as an appreciator, he's deeply, you know, enraptured by narrative, and it's something that he's getting out of, um, you know, Colette, James, some of his his other passions. So uh, Joel, I wanted to just talk to you about his relationship with St. Louis and the other Washington University professors, Elkin, Nemirov, et cetera, and how their papers intertwine with one another and, and um, what the body of work is that you can talk to. Yeah, so of course, as we've you know, talked about the writers um, in the Modern Literature Collection who are associated with WashU, um, or very close knit. Um, it's it's kind of funny. I found I I found out, you know, Mary and and Bill told me um, very directly that um, Bill was not never taught in the writing program, and I I was kind of puzzled by that because in the archive um, I would see advertisements for the writing program from the 70s and 80s, and they would list uh, Elkin and Nemiroff and and um, and Elkin and others, um, John Morris, um, and and William Gass, uh, and so they were, in fact, uh, us using his um, celebrity, I'll just say, uh, to bring students to the university. But he actually was never part of the writing program. But that's and, and so another anecdote with that is um, uh, Mona Van Dyne and Jarvis Thurston, who uh, were part of the, uh, the English department really wanted Bill to come to WashU, but they had to convince, they had to wait for uh, an opening, I think, at the philosophy department um, for him to actually come. 
So, um, so it, it's, it's interesting that he's so closely related to and associated with these writers in the collection, with the English department, with the writing program, but he was kind of set apart in his own category. But you will find in his archive um, introductions in, uh, to all, just an endless list of writers who would come to St. Louis before and during the International Writers' Center um, and his, um, his deep appreciation for their work and for uh, them as people. Um, so, so yeah, the archive is really rich with um, showing that uh, his, his relationship with, with those writers. And the, when he would bring these people to the International Writers' Center, Lauren Corker would shoot me if I didn't say, he would, he would spend, I don't know how long he spent on them, but the introduction. So he would always right. get people, Jim could say it was not a Nobel Prize winner when he came to Wash U. Nor was Derek Walcott. He would get people like the year before they won the Nobel, which is a very weird talent to have. And then he would give these, you could publish a book of the introductions. Like I remember his introduction to David Foster Wallace. It was like a really, you know, in like 97. It's like a really uh, incredible experience. And then some of these writers, uh, the Gaddis Papers, mm -hmm. I think, now are at WashU. Oh, yeah, yeah. Joy's, um, Joy's papers, papers are, are here now. And really, that's thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Bill was very uh, instrumental in getting the William Gaddis Papers. Um, Bill was a great uh, friend of his, as well as an admirer of his work. And so he worked with the library to get a grant to bring the Gaddis Papers. Um, and then uh, through, uh, you know, the Hearst professorships, um, and associations with GAS, um, we get writers like Joy Williams um, still to this day, we're, we're still building on that legacy and so that's a really important point to make is, um, you know, we are still, it's an organic living uh, collection that still grows because of Bill GAS's uh, uh, involvement. Um, so physically at, on campus, if people are visiting St. Louis, where can they find you and where can they find the papers? Yeah, so we're in the Olin Library, um, right in the middle of Danforth campus and right on the first floor. Um, and that's where our reading room is and all of the um, modern literature collection is there. Um, so I, I'd just like to open it up to some final thoughts. If there are any questions, feel free to ask them now. And um, just final thoughts on um, other writers today that you, you feel are in his league. Is there anyone? Well, he was always, uh, as we've, as we've uh, asserted, he was always sort of uh, um, plowing lonely lonely road. Um, wasn't a lot of, weren't always, never were a lot of people who were interested in the things that he was primarily interested in. And I'll be perfectly honest, I can't think of anyone um, who is following directly after him at the moment. There's always going to be very few people. Um, I think there must be someone, there probably will be someone. But, but he, uh, he, he went took a very individual path. Um, um, Garth, when writing, um, do you have him in your head? No, not really, um, but it's, it's very hard, you know, it's very hard to think of anyone in our generation or the last generation or any sort of generations between him and us who's been quite so accomplished as both a practitioner and as a, a reader of fiction. It's a, it's a very, very unusual skill set to have. Um, the sculptor Donald Judd is also a great art critic and writer, but it's, it's like a complete fluke. You know, most um, fiction writers, when you catch them and they're not working, are kind of like al almost borderline incoherent, which is what makes the Sunday Times book review unreadable as you have a bunch of people who can't write criticism, you know, um, and, and everyone has an extra grind. Um, but, um, so, so that alone, I think, you know, for someone, you know, when, whenever I'm kind of doing 
anything essayistic, I just I feel like you know I I'm, I'd never be able to do to do this, um, and that alone to me is so impressive. Um, I think aesthetically, um, I I do think there are things that he was doing that not it, it, not many people are doing just because not many people have picked up on them yet. Yeah, it's um, not the, the focus on form and structure are not things that are taught in the MFA program. I mean, it, yeah. the fact that he didn't teach in an MFA program is, is really interesting and very telling in a certain way. Um, the writing that he did and the things that he championed are not really um, focused on in the writing programs, and that's where most literature comes from. And and so I, you know, I think there is a kind of bypass moment at the end of modernism, you know, of of assimilating exactly what. What was that going on there? Um, and I think there will be a legacy from that. Um, I think that uh, Wallace is one one person who I can think of um, who loved Owen Sutter's luck in particular, um, and who was interested in form and peculiarly anti-narrative in the same way. Um, and then, but then there's this other, uh, yet other piece, which is the. Um, you know, I think his interest in fascism and Hitler's little man and, and that whole thing. I was just reading, um, I'm on book six of the Knauskar, you know, 3,600 page Norwegian novel, and he's talk, starting to, you know, talk about what what is the channel between, you know, and, and sorry, day after the elections, like what is the channel between um, the gestural David Byrne, big suit, stop making sense enormity of fascism, and the lived experience of people driving their cars to the gas station, and Knausgaard's writing about that, and I'm, and I'm, I think there are probably many readers who are like, ooh, this is titillating, and I'm going like, oh yeah, yeah, I read the tunnel, like you know, like this is so 30 years ago. I, I think that that aspect of that work will continue to speak to anyone who has the fortitude to kind of make it to the end of the book. Um, so Jan, I know you had one more anecdote, and uh, okay. Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight, and please uh, go visit the papers at Washington University. And um, it's been an extraordinary evening. Thank you again, Mary, for honoring us with your presence. We really appreciate it. And um, all right. Well, good night, and have a great night.